we're going to jump right in. Um, this is sort of the, the basic 101 level of plan giving. I realize fully I'm probably skipping something that someone would consider essential, um, but I'm trying to hit the highlights as much as possible, as well as overlap it with some basics about fundraising. Um, so we'll just jump right in. I didn't realize that anyone was going to introduce me, and that's the first. Um, probably one of the most important things that you probably would find interesting, um, I spent however many years down at the IU Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Um, I was Gene Temple's graduate assistant and basically his ghostwriter for however many years. Um, so we produced a lot of material. Um, we were literally the team that built the school, with the name of school um, from the center. Um, and we did a lot of work with the fundraising school, um, including updating their chapter on ethics and fundraising, which was quite fun. So just to get a sense of who's here, um, just kind of raise your hands if you fall into any of these categories. Anyone with 10 plus years of experience and maybe wanted, okay, great. Uh, five to nine years of experience in the field? Okay. Uh, one to four years. I figured this would be closer to the vast majority. Okay. Mm -hmm. And anyone who is completely new, one year or less. Awesome. Okay. And then with plan giving, you suddenly have a lot of different people in the room. It's not just fundraisers. So who's here as a nonprofit professional? Okay. Um, any board members, volunteers, that category? Okay. And any in the other professional advisor category? Great. Okay, so we're going to kind of hit the highlights here and try to do a lot in an hour. Um, I'll hit some general background, statistics from fundraising and plan giving. Um, I sort of broke this presentation across the who, what, where, when, why, how um, of fundraising and plan giving and sort of how those interconnect. Um, <coughs> I'll have a really brief breakdown on plan giving methods, but you'll probably find that you'll end up having to go to other sessions to get more detail on that. There's just not really time in this session to hit that. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. And hopefully we can do it all in an hour. Okay, so really fast, giving in numbers. Um, this is according to Giving USA 2017. 2018 should be coming out any day here. Um, so giving by individuals totaled about $281 billion in 2016. Um, and plain giving in comparison with about $30.36 billion. Um, plain giving tends to be probably 8 to 10% of giving in general. It, it fluctuates some, but it doesn't follow um, the economic factors. Um, it can also spike, obviously, if you have a mega donor um, hit that data, it can just go through the roof. So you kind of have to realize that as you're looking at that data. Also, according to the nonprofit fundraising survey, um, they put out different surveys at different times of the year. Um, and they have different focuses, so not every single one will provide you with consistent data. Um, I've had this conversation with a lady who might have been driving crazy, but she's wonderful. Um, human services and health organizations are the most likely to promote plan giving, um, but it, there are relatively comparable numbers coming in from other areas of the sector. Um, in general, about 61% of respondents to that survey indicated that they promote plan giving in some way. Um, some more than others, of course. So we'll start off with the who. Who's involved in fundraising? It's much more than just your development staff, in theory. It doesn't always happen. Um, I have this conversation with board members and staff all the time. Oh, our board president doesn't really want to do fundraising. He doesn't think it's his job. And if we do force him to do it, he says he'll leave. Well, it's really conversations, guys. It is crazy. So really, you have to look at fundraising as being the entire organization. Again, some people more than others, but everyone has a part to play in fundraising, whether it's producing great programming and you're swinging a donor by on a tour or anything. This is all part of it. I've even given presentations where they bring in every single staff member for the entire organization just on a one-on-one course on what is fundraising, what does it look like, and why is everybody actually doing it. So anyway, back to the slide. Board members, staff, this is, again, program staff, leadership, development, operations, finance, you name it. 
Uh, volunteers are very often a part of the equation. Um, donors helping to fundraise from other donors. We were just talking about that in the last session. Um, having community advocates and partners is a big piece of the puzzle. A lot of times those are going to be people who show up at donor events, who help you with various programs in the community. Having them there as part of that presence, as sort of your letter of recommendation, you could say, for some donors, is actually really important. Um, I've actually been dragged along to donor events at other organizations by donors from a different organization because they're donors at both places and they just see all the development people as friends. Slightly awkward, but they work. <laughs> you actually learn a lot. When you go to other events, you wouldn't imagine. And then, of course, with Plain Giving, you have this addition of uh, professional advisors, attorneys, finance people, um, banks, you name it, um, I'm sure I'm missing probably at least you could double this list easily on who else is involved. So who's supposed to be giving? If you haven't heard or seen a donor pyramid, this is what it looks like. Some people have never seen this. Some people see this every day. It's on their wall in their office. Um, this is what a donor pyramid is. It starts off with sort of the universal prospects. These are actual donors, and then you work your way up with sort of the the great tip that everyone aspires to being your plan gift donor. We'll talk about that more too. So who actually gives through plan giving? The likelihood that you have a 25 year old give a plan gift is probably not really high. We'll just put that out there. More likely you'll see 40 to 60, some studies say over 65, I've seen some that say it's more likely to be 50 to 70, but it'll be somewhere in that range. They're most likely to be college educated, bachelor's degree, or higher. Um, there are some people, like through a university situation, where you may have people who started in your program but didn't graduate. Those people are not as likely as the people who actually graduated from the institution. That's just what the studies have found. The people who give through planning giving are motivated by helping others, by religious beliefs, by giving back. Similar motivations to that. Um, where obviously that generosity component is in their blood. Um, they're likely to be a donor already to your organization in some capacity. They might be a $5 donor, they might be your mega donor. Very, very broad range. And then approximately one to 3% um, of the organization's donor base are that tend to be more than that. Yeah. So it is a relatively small number, but it doesn't mean that they're not. So um, a lot of the study and a lot of the research in this area is based on the university setting. It's just the reality of the, of the data. Um, within that environment, about 73% of the gifts originate from alumni. Um, however, that does not influence the size of their gifts, um, whether or not they're an alumni of the institution, um, just the likelihood that they will have that affinity um, or will be starting to make gifts increases through that affiliation. If you're not in a university, this might be the people who are most likely to attend your symphony, or the people who are you know, using your programs on a regular basis, people who have a strong affinity to your organization. And then sort of that 80-20 principle really applies in plain giving just as much as elsewhere in fundraising. Um, about 82% of planned gifts originate from the top 20% of donors. The top 10% of donors give about 66% of planned gifts. Okay, so we did the who, so now we're on the what. Um, I really love this definition because the, the business dictionary gets down to the nitty gritty. You're here soliciting financial support. Like that's, that's about as basic as it gets. Um, and in the much more fluffy relationship driven world of fundraising, um, the greater New Orleans Foundation has said fundraising is much more than asking people for money. The true purpose of fundraising is not to raise money, but to raise donors. The only way you can raise money year after year is by developing a broad base of loyal individual donors who are committed to your work. You're welcome to steal this. I stole it from that. Just with the attribution. <laughs> That's the professor of me coming out. Please cite your inspiration. Okay, what type of fundraising initiatives are you pursuing? And this is a really huge question uh, that influences everything you do and how you respond. Um, you need to identify what the purpose is, what the big, broad 
um, concept is, um, operations, of course, are ongoing, programmatic, ongoing. If you're doing campaign work, that should not be out ongoing, ever. If you're in an institution where someone thinks that's kosher, it's not, um, it leads to a big issue called campaign fatigue, um, where basically donors are being approached uh, constantly for these really, 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 really big gifts um, and there is supposed to be sort of lag time between those campaigns, so you do have time to catch up on operational and programmatic support, um, and also to give you the chance to evaluate what happened, how did it go, where can we improve. Um, otherwise, um, I've also heard of a lot of staff moving from organization to organization to organization and being caught in campaigns at every single one of them, which leads to fatigue of staff. Um, and so everyone leaves the field. Um, so it's an important part of not only your strategic look at what you're doing, um, but also your um, recruiting and retention of staff, which is another presentation, another publication I just put out, um, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. So really the campaign, back to the slide, um, it, that's intended for endowment funding or capital projects. So what is plan doing? These are gifts that have some form of legal contract, um, Use contract loosely if you're a lawyer, think of that loosely. Um, established by the donor during their lifetime, um, quite often there is some form of tax benefit to them. Um, the full gift of, the full benefit of the gift is most likely to be deferred um, to the organization until after their death. Um, plan giving involves, again, the peak of the donor pyramid, it's the ultimate goal of the donor, um, and it's likely to be the last gift that they make within their lifetime. Of course, that's assuming that they don't set up um, a foundation and that's a whole other set of issues. Like I said, as much information as I can pack into an hour. So some plan gifts can be used to increase a donor's level of philanthropic engagement in an organization, um, but it is part of sort of a broader strategy of how to um, cultivate the donor. So where does fundraising happen? Fundraising happens in a lot of different places. As we said, there's events, there's mail pieces, phone conversations, email, social media. You might be submitting a very formal grant request. Um, there are digital fundraising campaigns. Um, and of course, there are the in-person components, whether that's in an individual space or if that's in the organization space. With planned giving, you are much more likely to have an in-person component. Um, that can happen um, via phone, that kind of thing, um, but you're more likely to have an individual donor visit um, or where the individual is meeting with a professional advisor of some kind in a one-on-one -on -one setting as opposed to a you know, massive 200 people event invited to a ballroom. Um, you can include um, mail pieces, printed electronic literature, as part of this process, um, but a lot of that is going to be, again, pointing you back to that one-on-one -on -one component. Um, so that may include um, language that can be included in a will, that may just be, you know, check a box so that we know to send you plan giving material or have a uh, development staff contact you, um, any of that kind of thing. Um, and using those communications pieces can oftentimes be part of a larger strategy to push out information about plan giving um, across your donor pool. So when do we do fundraising? This is really looking at sort of what are the time frames, what are the timelines for your fundraising. Um, it needs to make sense for your donors, it needs to make sense for your organization and the strategy and the calendar year of activities. Um, but depending on the size of the gift, this is just broadly looking at fundraising in general. A first time gift of $50,000 can take about 13 years in a university setting. That could vary highly uh, within another setting, but that's the data we've got. Um, we may also um, be the result of many smaller gifts where you're working your way up to get to the point where they're giving that major gift. Um, but only 7% of donors in that study gave a $50,000 gift as their first gift. Um, so there really is that you know, vast majority are working their way up. Depending on the initiatives, the time frames are very different. 
Um, Short-term projects, obviously, are more likely you'll be focusing on smaller gaps. The likelihood that you're working on your big major gap for a short-term project isn't as likely. Um, that's more likely to be in the capital campaigns where you've got at least a year that you're working on a given project. Um, and then also your annual appeals, your ongoing operations, those are going to be smaller numbers in general. So this is just a really rough chart um, to kind of give you the idea that you're moving people up through um, sort of this life cycle of giving um, throughout their lives, starting with the first gift. And that first gift could happen when they're 20, that first gift could happen when they're 50. Um, it doesn't really matter, they're still having to move through basically that same line of um, options, again, sort of peeking out with that plan to get to the end. Okay, so for university plan giving, um, it's about 30 years after graduation, so again, that's taking you sort of in that 50, 55 range. Um, is sort of that most likely time that you'll see that to start getting help. Um, donors are more likely to give plain gifts specifically as they age. It's just the options, financial stability. Um, they're looking at retirement. They're looking at um, end of life options. Um, in general, it's sort of 50 is your kind of peak time. Um, if you take out trusts and annuities, again, looking at those retirement options, um, then that number shifts back to about 45. So you can kind of see how the options themselves influence the ages. Okay, so you need to look also at sort of this broader question, whether it's plan giving or fundraising in general, looking at why are these funds needed for your organization? And you have to think beyond just your staff, your perspective as a staff member, and your perspective as an organization. You need to be thinking about what does this project do for your community? What does this project do for your constituencies, your partners, all of that? You need to be looking at how it fits with your mission and how it fits with your strategic plan. It's not supposed to be, again, slight rant, it's not supposed to be your executive director's pet project. Sad but true, that is not how this is supposed to work, and oftentimes the donors can tell when that's the case, because they're saying, this is, like, where did this come from? This is not, what this organization has always been. I've given to you guys for 50 years. Where did it come from? They want to see consistency. They want to see strategy. They want to see impact. That's what we're seeing across the board, and it's just becoming increasingly the case. So you really need to be looking for a strong fit, need, or connection for your donors to the organization. Um, and in some cases, you may find for individual donors, it's not a strong fit. They may say, this is not a match for Come back and we find something else, maybe try a different program, maybe they're really interested in helping fund capital, but they really don't want the day-to-day. -day. You may have someone who's completely opposite of that. You just don't know. So it's again important to have those conversations. But if you're also seeing pushback from your donor base in general, there's two different things. You may need to work significantly on donor education so that they know what's going on in your organization, why it's their priority, how to go about it. Or you guys may have to go back to the drawing board and say, why are we seeing so much pushback? Is this really a good idea? Um, and sometimes you really just need to rethink what you're doing. So part of this sort of why question is to develop a case for support. And this can definitely overlap with your plan giving um, communication. So uh, if you don't know what a case for support is, don't feel bad. OK, we all have to start somewhere. Um, this is sort of your, think of it as a folder with all of the materials on your organization, your financial overview, who is on your board, what is the project, if you have a general brochure on what is your organization, um, if you have any campaign material that's part of a broader campaign, um, basically it's all in one place. And you may not use all of that when you go visit with a donor or talk to a donor, but you need to have that at least internally so that's a really great resource. Everyone's pulling from the exact same information every time. Um, if you have a really strong communication staff, they will likely have developed a lot of that language out um, so that, again, you're pulling the same sentence. It doesn't matter who you're talking to. If you're talking to a corporation or an individual, it's saying the exact same thing. Um, 
In some cases, too, um, that may also um, have a really strong marketing or branding component where it's, it has to be such and such language, such and such font, such and such color. Um, again, that just depends on the organization of how strict that um, system is. Um, but part of the case for support should really include your plan giving materials. Those should line up um, with what everything else is so that it's a very natural fit um, if you're sending a bunch of communications out or if you're developing communications for a campaign, you have everything in there or it may have a very specific line for plan giving and then in that case for support, you already have this is the brochure that's going to go out when it's requested. So it's all together. We're going to think also about the how. How do we do funding? How do we do plan giving? You have to think beyond just the raising funds step. <coughs> there's stages, there's components, there's staff to this. And um, so obviously educating donors is a big part of it, letting them know what's going on, how does this work, what does this process look like. Um, that may include events, that may include materials. You may be thinking about how can we put this kind of information on our website so if someone goes and Googles something, they're getting consistent information, maybe even more information, excuse me, than they would think to be able to get. Um, you need a strong means of tracking donor information for a really small organization. That may be an Excel spreadsheet. I do not recommend Word. I've heard it from people. It's not going to work. Um, so having a records management system, no matter how robust, you need to have all of that data reported um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, you need a means of thanking and acknowledging donors. Uh, that might be the great acknowledgement wall that you see when you walk into this building. It just says, the Schoolcraft College Foundation. Um, or it might be in the back of your annual report. So there's a whole variety of options, but you do need to be acknowledging your donors and thanking them. Um, and then also, um, as part of this, you need to be thinking about how you can strategically work with your network of partners. And um, this is even beyond your donors. This might be, you know, talking to other organizations in your community, finding out what they're doing, um, if there are partnership opportunities, um, and then also linking in with other groups that are doing and giving so you can learn more about it in general. It's just a small pitch for the plan giving company. Um, to be able to access resources um, about plan giving to do that work better because it is a little bit trickier um, by yourself. So these are some tools that, again, pretty basic level um, that will help you sort of integrate plan giving into your larger fundraising plan. Back to the donor pyramid, here we are again. Um, this is a really great way of sort of determining where your donors are on their lifelong journey of giving. Um, so this way you can, you know, look at your data, look, you know, talk to different people and say, you know, how many first-time donors do we have? You know, is such and such donor really, you know, are they ready? Are they really stuck in sort of their renewed annual? Is this really a good time or do we need to be strategically thinking about moving them up because they should really be planning givers, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so kind of looking at that as part of your broader strategy. Um, if you haven't seen this, it's a gift range chart. Um, these do vary a little bit between annual giving campaigns versus um, capital or that sort of campaign. Um, but again, it allows you to strategically look at who are your donors, where are they at, how big of the gifts are they, um, and who is most likely in your donor pool to have the capacity to be able to do plan giving. My favorite Gift acceptance policies and fundraising guideline documents. If your organization does not have one of these, they really, really, really should. This should be like top priority on your to-do list coming out of this conference for creating one of these. Um, this allows you to plan internally um, as well as develop restrictions on what acceptable gifts are and what your processes are within your organization when someone approaches you with a gift. If you have a donor who shows up and says, I would like to offer you my field of corn. Do you have a plan for that? <laughs> because not a lot of organizations do. Um, cows, their house, it happens, and a lot of organizations don't have a way to say no 
And that is exactly what these documents do, is provide you a way to say no in an official, professional, happy way. Um, where you can say, you know, this is against policy, or we had this reviewed by such and such committee on our board. They regularly review these offers. Um, that's exactly what these documents are, are for. Um, I did provide a link if you want to see lots and lots of samples, um, if you need to update yours, if you need to create one. Um, on a super simple level, um, I like this one. It just sort of says, you know, it has to be consistent with our mission. You can't, you know, accept something that is polar opposite of what you do because that would be crazy. Um, you know, it's intended to support programs, special projects, keep it on track. Um, that donations are generally accepted except for list of limitations. Um, especially for our smaller organization, it's very likely that you may not have the capacity to take on certain kinds of gifts, and that's okay. But that's what this is there for, is to make it very obvious in a way that the donors can see, your board can see, your staff can see, this is not acceptable. If you have a program person who says, oh, I just had so-and-so walk up to me, they want to give us X, you can say, we have a gift acceptance policy, and we need to have a conversation with the donor based on that. And then also um, having a procedure internally of maybe it's a finance committee of your board who is responsible for reviewing that. Um, and that may be one of those great places if you have a lawyer on your board to put them on one of these committees that is responsible for reviewing these kinds of gifts um, just to save you um, from the weird and unusual things that do happen on a regular basis. Um, and I have a really great resource at the end of this, too, um, that you can get even more information on that specific brain. Wait, wait, actually, time for questions. You're checking me up. Okay. Um, another really great tool is to create what's called a legacy society. Um, these are called many, many different things um, within, I spent many years in the museum world. Um, so whenever I think of people giving unusual gifts, I think of objects, um, and it leaves all sorts of things. In that arena, um, these are oftentimes membership levels, um, depending on how your organization is structured. Um, it might be a giving circle, which is not, giving, giving circles are now multiple different things, um, but these are all sort of similar. They're just called different things, that's why I don't know this thing. Um, but basically, this is a group of donors who have designated in some way and told you in some way that they are doing planned giving um, to your organization. So this is your means of um, recognizing them, inviting them to things, communicating with them under sort of one designated brand. Um, in universities and other nonprofits that have been part of various studies, um, donors are made um, part of these legacy societies. Um, as I said, it's sort of these members of these groups. Um, they, they oftentimes give larger paying gifts than non-members, sort of back to what they were talking about this morning, um, giving that recognition, having it, an ability for you to go back to them and say, thank you so much. Have you thought of giving another gift or a bigger gift or a different type of gift? Um, I think that's probably the most likely reason that you see that be the case where they are more likely to have larger claim gifts. Um, some groups have an opt-in system, some groups have an opt-out system of whether or not donors are included in that. Um, basically, it helps create a sense of community and a greater affiliation with the organization. Um, and for you, as an internal staff member, it gives you a means of really developing a greater strategy around how you incorporate plan giving and those donors into your larger development strategy, as well as into your larger communications and marketing strategy. This is another um, tool that when I would work with Gene Temple, he would always put this in his uh, PowerPoint presentation, so I just kind of got used to doing it. Um, but especially for plan giving, it sort of gives you a better idea of where do these gifts come from within someone's finance. Of course, with annual funds, that's being pulled from most likely it's just their current income. It's probably the last paycheck that landed in their bank account. Um, 
who are major gifts and capital campaigns, that's where you're more likely to see them pulling from other forms of assets that they have. Um, you know, maybe someone has that capacity in their bi-weekly paycheck, but most people don't. It's really going to be coming from assets. And then of course the plan given is coming from that estate planning, um, looking at sort of their larger financial portfolio. So how does plan giving fit into property? And this is sort of the big question we've been looking at. Um, plan gifts are common for endowments and campaigns. It's not as likely to be for operational support unless they're saying, we really, really want this to go toward um, an unrestricted endowment or something like that. Um, plan guests require a fundraising approach with a particularly strong investment policy, um, a legal structure which may involve documentation, processes, or someone who reviews that with a legal background. Excuse me, um, as well as an established set of roles and responsibilities for board and staff and the process. Like I said, going back to that gift acceptance policy um, for how you determine if you're going to accept the gifts and sort of how does that run when someone says this person has passed away. Okay. So this is sort of the big asterisk in this entire presentation. You may not actually be ready for plan giving. And that's okay. Not all organizations are, as we saw from the statistics earlier, you know, only a certain percentage of organizations are pushing plan giving in any fashion, no matter how big or small. So you need to look at variables such as the age of your organization, the size, the purpose, the staffing, or other variables entirely um, that may just make it impossible um, for you to do plan gifts. If you're brand new um, and you don't know if you're going to make it past five years, plan giving might not be the thing for you. You may need to really focus on you know, the urgent operational side. Um, some organizations also sort of take that middle ground, again using those um, gift acceptance policies and that kind of thing, where they say, yeah, we'll do plan giving, but we're only going to do certain because we just don't have the capacity or the expertise or the know-how or the connections. Or you may say, we just can't afford the lawyers and the financial advisors um, to do it. So um, in those cases, they say, you know, it's not going to be everything, but we'll try some of the easy stuff. Um, and again, going to that accept gift acceptance policies, I've seen a lot, for instance, that just say, we're open to almost everything except real estate. Because I... I have hilarious stories. Um, when I was done at IU, there was a guy who was solely responsible for traveling the country and working on planned gifts that were real estate. And he had amazing stories of traveling to, I think my favorite was the one where it was a nudist colony and someone wanted to donate their home at the nudist colony. And they had to figure out, what do we do? Is this possible? Is this reasonable? Not ideal. Not <laughs> this is why we have restrictions, because those can say different. Some of you. So again, this is really, really broad. We're not getting down to any level of technical detail. Um, for, in terms of plan giving, there are three broad categories of asset types. There are non-probate transfer vehicles. This is a really huge term. Um, transfer on death deeds um, that can be directed to a nonprofit without involving a probate. If you've ever opened a bank account, um, a retirement account, anything like that, the, you'll get near the end and it will say, please designate who your beneficiary will be. It could be your spouse, it could be your child, it could be your neighbor, whatever. There's a beneficiary listed. When you pass away, that money automatically, no matter what is in your will, will go to that person. So if that person has predeceased you, then there's a secondary beneficiary that has that. <coughs> it's all pre-designated, it will not appear in court. It doesn't matter if that's what you even want it to still be. If you died before changing it or didn't realize you needed to change it, too bad. It happens way more often than you think, but that is what that category is. There's also non-cash assets. Um, these are life insurance policies, retirement accounts, property, other security, this is going to be your common form category, 
um, is in there. And then real property is primarily based off land, building, machinery. Um, these are the things that you're more likely to have a mortgage on or a loan. Um, so they might be encumbered, they might be non-encumbered. Uh, you may have partial ownership in them. Um, that's what that category is. Um, in terms of plan giving types and super, super broad version, um, a charitable bequest uses a will, trust, or estate plan of some kind to designate a charitable gift. Um, it may be in the form of a monetary amount, a percentage, or a remainder left over from the estate. Um, there's also charitable gifts and annuities. Um, these involve an agreement between the donor and nonprofit. This does not involve your will. Um, this is in exchange for um, a donor's relatively large gift. And the nonprofit pays the donor a set annual income over time and then retains the left over amount after the death. And then finally, there's the charitable remainder trust, huge category. Um, a trust is given to the nonprofit that pays out an annual amount to the trustees with the nonprofit keeping the left over amount. Um, there's also remainder annuities, which have annual payouts. Um, remainder unit trusts have a payout of a percentage of the remaining funds. Um, and then the lead trusts, uh, the nonprofit receives the annual payout of the fund with the beneficiaries. Yeah. The beneficiaries receiving the remaining amount. Again, super broad definitions just for your reference. If you're looking for a much more nitty gritty um, on any of these topics, the other sessions are for, um, but this is again just so you kind of have that background when you're hearing these terms when you're looking at this. Um, that's sort of what they mean by all these things. Um, and then I like this chart. Um, this came from the plan giving study that came out in 2016 um, from IU, um, where they did this huge study that involved five universities, all their data. Um, and they combined it all together and said this is actually the types of plan gifts that are represented in these university studies. Um, the vast majority were requests, um, second followed by charitable gift annuities, a variety of trusts. As you can see, there's the tiny 2% of the charitable lead annuities and unit trusts in there, um, as well as life insurance, individual retirement accounts, that kind of thing. Um, the only information that's not really in here quite as much, um, at least in a lot of these studies, um, from CMF, we get a lot of questions about donor advised funds, and they do not show up in these studies. Um, that's something I've been looking for, um, but that's sort of a, another conversation, another topic for another day. Um, but you are starting to see that more and more as part of a, a broader um, philanthropic set of options. Oh, we're actually doing well. Cool. Okay, so these are some helpful resources. Um, from doing Ask came up, I'm always sending people off to do their own research a little bit um, because you always have great opportunities to learn, um, do more deep dive for yourself to learn more. Um, one of the great resources is the National Association of Charitable Gift Planners. Um, you know how I said there's a really great resource about when things get weird and someone wants to give you cows? Um, that's the gifts from Cousin Eddie. Um, this is hilarious. It was actually based on an entire conference presentation that someone did. I wish I, there was a video of it because I'm sure it was amazing. Um, but this is, this. It's, I think it's like a 50 page document that covers all sorts of information on different areas. Um, but you can kind of follow that link to get to it. Um, there are guidelines for reporting and counting charitable gifts, um, the model standards of practice for the charitable gift planner. So this is your ethical standards document for planned giving. If you're looking for what do I do when, that's the source you need. Um, valuation standards for charitable planned gifts, that can become an issue as well. Um, if you're looking for more information sort of statistically on what's going on in the planned giving world, um, this is the plan giving study I just referenced and followed through there. And I think you have to, I don't remember if that's the PDF itself or if you have to click a link in it um, to get to it. Um, and then if you're part of a small nonprofit, I sort of wanted to represent that too. Um, AFP has a really great publication about specifically how do you do plan giving in a small nonprofit setting because it's a little bit different 
um, and it comes with its own sort of character in the end, rather than being, you know, a lot of this information is, of course, created with the huge institutions in mind, the universities, the hospitals, um, so um, having some of these resources that are more specific to that smaller nonprofit is really important. Okay, so we actually have time for a few of I'm really glad. I'm not sure how long that would go. Questions? Yes. Uh, you made this social media for mm -hmm. the vehicle. With plan giving, what do you mean by that? Um, with plan giving, um, it's probably going to be part of just general communications. I'm seeing social media primarily in terms of fundraising generally, um, but you may find that it's worth a shout out periodically of, you know, we have this great plan giving program, or we just did this great event with our plan giving legacy group with a picture, just so there's awareness of it, um, or a link to here's how you find out more. But that's probably like that surface level is about as far as you're going to get with social media. As a non-Twitter user, <laughs> I probably would give a very biased opinion about that. Um, again, a lot of the social media is very, very surface level, so it works nice as fluffy communications. Um, finding those like really strategic means, it's, a, it's quite shaky. Um, I don't know. Yeah, no, I. It's not my favorite means, um, and some of the stuff surprisingly unstable. Um, and from a historical perspective, in terms of keeping record of what's happened, what your conversations are, it's very... You can copy a case. Yeah, but you're going to have to retain it in another, in another system. situations I've heard with that are actually very similar to what they were talking about this morning, where there is a component of that to gain information in a comfortable setting, but then where there's follow-up and still have some level of that one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, back to the <coughs> social media comment, you also have to keep in mind who your audience is and thinking about the age level and the income level and where they are in their life stage. You know, Facebook actually is, is is used by a lot of the older clients that we see, but Twitter is not. Mm -hmm. And email actually is not really a trusted, some, you know, some of them it is, some of it is. And so you really have to take into account who is truly, who are our donors? Yeah. And what are they going to react to? Are we hitting the wrong audience by trying to be overly socially, mm -hmm. social media savvy about yeah. it? Another component of that that I don't think is brought up often enough is the concept of data security for your organization. If you're having conversations, it may not be on Twitter, of course, but in other um, settings, sometimes that data just is not secure enough and you really shouldn't be sharing it, um, especially through things like Facebook, putting out really sensitive information that's not really where you want to be putting it, and you're then you know, putting your donor in a spot if that data is stolen, you know, they didn't ask for that to be put out there, but you're putting it out there. So you have to be very careful um, about protecting your donors in that way. Uh, this might be an, an awkward question, but um, do you have any experience with a donor giving a recipient uh, gift to the organization with a percentage that is uncomfortable giving? If you don't know their, you don't know what that looks like. So they say, I'm going to need to my table. What's your table? I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. So how do you how do you quantify that? I guess I mean, what are, what are some good best practices to power that? Because that had to happen a couple times, and it's kind of become a hard roadblock to overcome mm -hmm. in terms of well, stop the ten percent of your state well, it could be ten thousand, it could be a hundred thousand. You don't know. Yeah. And you might have an idea of their capacity because of the work that you've done with them. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times there are people have assets that you don't know about, and they aren't completely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and a lot of donors, you know, that's for their own safety, and they are going to hide that as much as possible. Um, there are some ways to research and dig around um, and ask people and that kind of thing, um, but some of that information is just going to be private, and you just have to do the best you can um, to do research while realizing you may not know. Um, and there's also the possibility that you know, something will happen with the estate and certain things will get tugged around and even if they told you that number was not going to be right anyway. So sometimes that's even why they're saying things in those broad terms. Do you remember asking for a range though? Like just to say, you know, can you just give me some type of idea just so we have an idea of like what the likely gift is going to be once you do pass away so that we know. I mean if we're talking just I guess in terms of the difference of a thousand and a hundred thousand, there's a huge you know, there's a lot yeah. changing impact yeah. in that in that range. So curious just how in your experience you kind of overcome that, you know, resistance to, um, to say. Depending on where your area is, what your area in the field is, I've talked to uh, other people who are kind of in similar organizations get a sense of that because they may have a, a better sense of what the donor pool is in their area. Um, personally, as a donor, if someone asked me that question, I probably won't have to. Okay. So, um, you know, you just really have to know is there a reason why they're saying that? Are they, if they're very open, that might be a perfectly fine question. If they're very protective of um, their situation. Um, I know in Indy, we had a couple donors that were incredibly protective, even down to the point they didn't want people to know where they lived because they had received threats and things. So, you know, you really have to be careful. But yeah, t um, one of the things I found in this field specifically is talk to your colleagues. They're a great asset um, and they have probably the best sense of what's going on in your area, what's kosher, what's not, um, as well as other resources that are available on really, really specific topics like <coughs> Some groups too that use sort of a rolling number um, where they'll say, on average, our plan of giving people gave X amount over the course of five years, and they use that as sort of the rolling average um, to help at least plan on some level. Yeah, that's really I did want to put out my contact information because I'm sure there will be follow-up questions. Um, feel free to contact me for any of these means. I also put out my um, business card as well. Again, as I was mentioning to some people, my contact information at the bottom um, on the roster is not right at all. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you guys had access to that too for follow-up. Fantastic. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, yes, thanks. So make sure you get these. I'm glad you put your contact info up because I was going to ask about that. I guess you could always call the contact CMF and they can yeah, be indirectly yeah. that way as well. So uh, I want to thank my good friend, Mac Friedman, who unfortunately couldn't be here. He had a uh, last minute conflict, but uh, Tanner Friedman. Uh, is a great supporter and sponsor strategic communications of uh, this event and as well as a lot of the media that we do if you look at our spot on the radio for uh, May for Legal Legacy and Plan Giving, the proclamation from the governor, all that. Matt helps us with us, so with these things. So if you have any uh, media needs, I'd, I'd encourage you to reach out to Matt. And even though he's not here today, I want to express our appreciation for his support. We have a little gift for you, Brittany. Um, 
hopefully it's something that you like. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to you. It was uh, great to get acquainted. It's nice to have somebody in our local market that is a, a great resource like you are. So I would encourage all of you uh, to follow up with questions. You have our contact info. Uh, and the slides that you use today are actually out on the, the website, so you can get them there and print them if you want to refer back to them. So thanks to all of you for being here. Hopefully you're enjoying the day. The next session starts at 11. And so hopefully you have a roster of uh, where you're going. I think uh, Dr. Russell James will be in this location. But uh, take a look and if you have a minute to use the restroom or grab a beverage before the next session starts. Thank you. Good morning, and I'm glad that you are still with us. I want to thank uh, Henry Ford Village for being our sponsor for this session, and especially uh, Teresa Port. Is Teresa with us right now? Hi, Teresa. Thank you very much and uh, to being our sponsor. Uh, very excited to introduce our speaker today. Uh, this is uh, Russell James, who is JD, PhD, and CFP. Uh, has lots and lots of great credentials, has a YouTube channel, has books available on Amazon, and in his spare time, he is a professor in the Department of Personal Financial Planning at Texas Tech University. He directs the on-campus and online graduate program in charitable financial planning. And he is in demand uh, throughout the United States and uh, even into Alaska. He's going there next week uh, to talk about plan giving. We are very uh, fortunate to have him with us today. So. I'm going to turn it over to him to maximize his time with us. Thank you, Dr. Russell, for, or Dr. James. For Thanks so much. Well, I'm looking forward to sharing some results from research and some very practical uh, results as well. And as a, as a